Welcome back after the break. And we are now ready for the next panel, which will speak about a variety of approaches that CSDs can use in order to optimize their business capabilities and scale up. Building upon the current levels of legal market practice harmonization, the panel will speak about leveraging the standardization of market practices, optimizing its IT systems, developing new services, and performing cross-border optimization as well. I expect that the experts on this panel have a lot to say, as their firms are all bright examples of how to deliver optimized CSD solutions, overcoming the divergent market practices and differences in laws and complexities of the existing barriers. I'm sure that the panelists will be having a very fruitful discussion for us today. And I welcome to this stage Jesus Benito, Head of Domestic Custody and Trade Reports Trade Operations of the SIX Group, uh, which also includes BME and Iberclear that function in a Spanish market. So welcome, Jesus, and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are located. First of all, thanks to the organizers for giving me the honor of moderating this panel with such distinguished panelists. Uh, and at this point in time, let me give you my sincere congratulations to all of the organizers and especially to Anna and a colleague for the way the event is developing and the very interesting sessions we have enjoyed so far. And I really hope this panel is also of your interest. And now let me introduce uh, the panelists. I will start by Pierre Davou. Pierre is chairman of Euronext, Euronext Securities. Hello, Pierre. The next hello. one is, hello, Hannah Bainio, the CEO of Euroclear Finland. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Jesus. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hello. Then let's introduce you, Javier Jara, who is the only one I'm going to pronounce correctly, I'm sure. Javier Jara. Hello. <laughs> Javier is head of legal and corporate affairs DCV, the Chilean CSD. And in addition, of course, you are the president of the America's Central Securities Depository Association, AXDA. And of course, you are going to participate not as AXDA chairman, but uh, uh, as the Chilean representative of the CSD in Chile. Good morning, uh, everybody. Hello, Javier. The next one is Ekrem Arikan, CEO and board member of uh, MKK, the Turkish CSD. Hello, Ekrem. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. And last but not least, we have Indars Askurk, who is the CEO of Nasdaq CSD. Hello. So let me, hello, Indas. Let me start by introductory words. Um, this panel discussion we are going to start in a minute after my introductory words goes around the idea of CSDs offering services beyond the core services that a CSD must necessarily offer to be considered as such. In terms of uh, the European Union regulation, the CSDR, we might offer ancillary services in addition to the notary, central settlement, and central asset servicing core services. What adjacent services might be offered by CSDs? Why and how will be some of the topics that we will analyze in a, min in a minute. Over the last few years, CSDs have demonstrated the importance and the reliability of our core services as, as financial market infrastructure, overcoming financial crisis and economic and social disturbances. Now, the question is, why not to take advantage of our infrastructures and our central and pivotal position in the financial markets to expand our services offering to other services beyond those core services that I mentioned a minute ago? And of course, how to do it in such a way that we do not affect our low risk profile of our core mission? Before giving the floor to our panelists, let me explain to you what we are doing in six group in this respect. As far as the Spanish CSD is concerned, we have always considered registration as one of the most relevant functions in which Abeclia might expand in terms of adjacent services. Yesterday, Paco Bejar explained Renade, which was created in 2005 for registering CO2 allowances in accordance with Kyoto's protocol, and the voluntary DLT registry for carbon credits that we have been developing since 2020. Also, as a registration system in 2010, together with Clearstream, 
we launched ReGSTR, our trade repository, through a joint venture. Just two months ago, the Clear bought the remaining 50% owned by our Clear Stream colleagues. So we have now in six group two trade repositories, ReGSTR and 6TR. Of course, we are also developing DLT proof of concepts for different topics, such as the issuance of hybrid digital bond, guarantee banks registry, and the loyalty shares. The sixth Spanish CSD, Abeclear, is also trying to expand its services to extend the custody services, mainly services for issuers, shareholders identification, proxy voting, special corporate events with options, and so on. And for our participants, Swift Service Bureau and outsourcing back office services. With regards to our six, uh, six Swiss CSD infrastructure, we expanded geographically. Our international custody offering is now physically covering the US, Asian, and of course the Spanish markets by <laughs> opening offices in the US, Singapore, and with the support of Abreclia, Spain. Having said this, I think now is the time for our panelists to explain their current and envisaged ancillary services very briefly, please. And I will start offering the floor to Pierre Pierre, could you tell us what you are doing and what you have in your pipeline? Thank you very much, uh, Jesus. Let, let me first introduce your next securities because I think it's the first time we are present as your next securities to this uh, forum. So your next securities is a network of CSDs in Europe uh, owned by the your next uh, group. Uh, it encompasses four CSDs in uh, Italy, Portugal, Denmark and Norway that were formerly known as Monte Titoli, uh, Interbolsa, VP Securities, and VPS, and they all now operate under the same brand, your next securities. Um, so what, what we've done over the past um, three years uh, is to uh, grow our business by uh, acquiring CSDs. Uh, your next was only running one CSD back in 2019 in Portugal, and we acquired VP Securities, then VPS, and then, uh, then Monte Titoli to uh, build this network. So, so in looking backward, the focus has been really on expanding our footprint by adding more CSDs into that network. Now, if we look forward, um, indeed, the, the development of new services is, is a key priority for us. The way we look at our business is that, on the one hand, we have the core functions, issuance, custody, and settlement, where we have to deliver a very reliable and safe services to our customers. But at the same time, we have a portfolio of services, tax, data, asset services, and issuer services that is already well developed and that we grow further based on the demand of our customers. Um, I will elaborate uh, later on, on on how to develop especially uh, in some of these areas, but, but that's an important uh, growth area for us. And uh, year after year, we add new services in these four areas, data, tax, and asset, asset services, and mutual services uh, for uh, the benefit of our customers. Thanks, Pierre. Then, Hannah, what are you doing now? What do you have in the pipeline? Well, um, I'll do a bit the same to bring some context for the audience to EuroClear Finland. So first and foremost, uh, the Finland is a direct holding market. So we have 2.1 million accounts in our registrar where the client relationship uh, lies with the banks. Um, we have issuers as direct participants, and this is issuers that are listed and non-listed. And uh, I'm happy to say we are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year, so we're fairly young in that sense. But um, what is good to know is that yeah, as part of the Euroclear group, we are a bit the abnormally, meaning that we have our data centers in Finland, obviously all our stuff in Finland. We are about 115 or so FTEs and a, and a sort of similar size of consultants okay. a bit onshore and, and globally. Um, why we have data centers here, I think from a geological, uh, geopolitical perspective, I think that is worth saying, obviously due to our history and our so-called so Preparedness Act requires the local CSD to operate under any circumstances. So no, no matter what, we will need to run the CSD here in Helsinki. Um, because of the direct holding sort of model, we sit on a lot of data that has allowed us to build over the years jointly with our clients, our issuer services and the ancillary services, and we'll discuss it a little bit later on. And I think it's worth to say that uh, in 2012, we made the IT strategy decision to completely renew our 
core CSD platform. And so we got rid of the legacy in two parts. In 2015, we rolled out the mar money market uh, side of the business. And in 2018, our equity business. And we standardized very much towards the European standards. And uh, we did that by using the TCS market infrastructure package and uh, kept the customization rather limited. And uh, as a result, happy to say that we have a very modern architecture and uh, sort of a single solution and we are operating in a distributed environment and, and certainly it's, it's good to be in a place where you have no legacy depth. I uh, have to say that out loud. But this is obviously a strategic movement that uh, we are still in, in, in our business strategy uh, on our way to T2S outsourcing settlement next year in September 23. That is the target, hoping that there are no external factors as in less than two weeks, we are starting our client testing, our pilot testing. We have approximately 95% of the code ready uh, to start the preparations towards T2S. So that's that's a quick introduction into your Cliff Finland and our activities. Thank you, Hannah. Let's then move on to Javier. Javier, tell us about Chile, please. Okay, well, good morning and thank you for the invitation for WSC. Uh, as a, Jesus mentioned, I want to represent DCB Chile, not as a as a president of FAXTA. That is a, a first disclaimer. I would like to, to begin to provide you with some information about the CB Chile. We are a private company and, in, and the only CSD in the country. We work with both the private and public sectors, including registering the debt issued by the government of Chile, by the central bank of Chile, and also for all the securities issued by different entities in the country. All of our operations, of course, are executed under a legal framework and our activities are regulated by the Financial Commission Supervisor. We have been in operation almost 30 years and we manage today approximately $340 billion in custody and registered and processed in excess over 80,000 transactions per month. We also are working with a broad network international custodians uh, with the DTC in, in the case of the U.S. market, with Indeval in Mexico, we have also linked with Deceval in Colombia, with Peru uh, in the case of uh, Cavalli. Um, we provide cross-border custody services for all the Chilean investors which are investing abroad and also for foreign investors who are investing in the country. We have also two subsidiaries companies, one uh, which operate as a transfer agent service for more than 900 uh, companies in the country and uh, of course we provide all the services associated with the administration of the shareholders registered on funds also and we have another subsidiary which provide tax agent services for international custodians and as a member of ANA ask as a national number agent for Chilean securities uh, instrument and also this subsidiary is today providing a lot of data uh, statistics for the different institutions in the market. Uh, well, further, probably during the panel, I'm going to explain some specific project, uh, but it's a brief summary about the, the CSD in the Chile. Thank you, Javier. Let's then move to Ekrem. Ekrem, tell us about the Taki CSD, please. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, many thanks to all contributors for this great organization and greetings to all audiences. And uh, I can say that maybe the most important thing uh, we have done in terms of introducing new services was presenting uh, first a new vision to group our services. Uh, we call uh, all services under four different headings. It's made easier to classify all products and services and also helped for focusing uh, to develop and expand services under those four groups. Of course, we are a CSD, so it means uh, we, we are giving depository services. And the second one, uh, we are also a trade repository. We are giving trade repository services. And also, we are giving corporate governance services. And the last one is investor relations services. Under CSD services, uh, we have, of course, uh, our core business to uh, give services to capital markets uh, for years. And uh, we have started also giving the same uh, similar service to Tulip, which is e-warehouse uh, market. Uh, we were already giving this service for 
uh, electronic certificate for agricultural products actually uh, for years uh, but uh, three years ago uh, to consolidate the market this company has established in Turkey and we are developing uh, lots of services for new products for this market as well and uh, we have started to give the CSD service for crowdfunding platforms and the system which has started last year and uh, we have a new service in uh, for, for bureau share registry for jo joint stock companies uh, it means we are developing uh, classical uh, CSD services with new ones and uh, sometimes we are uh, offering new private CSD services for example uh, we added open request of uh, Turk Bankas of Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus uh, it was just a special uh, request and omnibus uh, infrastructure we have established with Euroclear and we are now uh, currently working with Azerbaijan MDM uh, the CSC of Azerbaijan and under trade repository services actually you know everybody knows here uh, it was firstly related with derivative markets but we have started to collect also data for uh, debt security uh, market and uh, reporting to authorities about it in Turkey locally and uh, another important uh, system we are working currently uh, for in under uh, trade poster services is uh, investor risk tracking system uh, if you are collecting data from financial uh, intermediary institutions and uh, establishing a system to analyze and uh, report uh, the authorities and corporate governance services pdp public disclosure platform is already well known uh, uh, but uh, EGM uh, system, Electronic General Meeting System, and EBDS, Electronic Board of Directors System, they are very uh, popular. It was very popular during the pandemic uh, period. And uh, uh, it's getting much more used uh, by companies and other countries as well. And investor services, it's, it's a traditional business. And we are, uh, during the pandemic, actually, it was uh, very important to, uh, to, to to give the service notifications and blockage uh, systems for investors. Uh, we developed this, this kind of things in investor side as well. Uh, for now, I can say just uh, this kind of things for the first introduction. Okay. Thank you very much, Krem. And last but not least, uh, we have Indus. Tell us about Nasdaq CDs. And sorry, I think I forgot to mention that you are also deputy chairman of Exta, but of course you are now representing only the Nasdaq CSD. Sorry, Indus. The floor is yours. That's right. Thank you. Uh, so Nasdaq CSD operates in four markets, in the Baltics, in Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, and then in Iceland. So we have more options uh, for various adjacency services, depending on the local market uh, needs. Uh, lately, actually, we've had a huge run in our markets, a lot of new companies, so uh, exercising on our role as a mere back office of stock exchanges has kept us busy. But historically, uh, ancillary services have been very important for us, probably because our individual markets are not that large, are still in, in developing and, and convergent states, so just in pure search for uh, new revenue that, that's been uh, very important so we um, we offer pension registrar businesses uh, in Latvia and Estonia um, we we have in the Baltic so-called two second tier pension system where all the taxpayers uh, put aside a part of the social tax payments that can be invested in their own investments via the pension funds and uh, we do all the registry, all the accounting. Uh, so that's that's big time service to, to our countries. It's uh, also a multi-million business line for ourselves, so very important. Uh, we provide uh, services to private unlisted uh, companies, actually in all four markets, but the, the biggest is in Estonia, where we have 6,000 companies. And that's clear value uh, value service to 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 those companies i mean their their owners can keep the holdings in the same way as they do for public securities if you do some transactions you can avoid all the paperwork or notaries or, or whatnot so uh, very attractive service 
Then we are going a bit more into B2C space, which sometimes has its own challenges because we are accustomed to, to work in B2B environment, but uh, still. So uh, we offer saving notes in, in Latvia and offer that in Lithuania as well, which is essentially retail government bonds. We have a separate platform. All the retails uh, can subscribe directly, actually without opening a securities account uh, in, in the bank. Then we offer LEI uh, service, and um, so we also have a deposit account service in Estonian market where actually investors can open uh, security account directly with a CSD without banks uh, in between, which is maybe not my favorite service because of all the AML requirements. But again, it was um, it was uh, government's uh, will to, to have such service. So we are there to service them. Then we provide IPO subscription service, both actually for equities and bonds, basically leveraging our uh, network and all the connections that we have for these uh, secondary uh, markets so basically that is applied also for the primary ipo market very efficiently because then the retail investors can simply simply subscribe for for new issues just like they do in the secondary market and the last one i would mention relatively new service uh, which we call uh, bulk icing uh, codes allocation service for whatever reason, in Latvia, there's a, a cluster with quite many P2P lending platforms. And now lately, they were uh, required to obtain investment firm license and all the uh, securitized uh, loans that they have in platform require ISIN codes. So uh, eventually, we'll be issuing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if, if not millions of ISINs. And then we have now dedicated solution for that. So quite handsome uh, suite of, of various ancillary services. Thank you, Indus. Thank you to all of you. Um, now we are moving very quickly. We are running out of time, actually. And I would uh, challenge you to answer the next questions in couple, three sentences at maximum to speed up the, the discussions. And my first question to all of you, I will give you the floor by order is uh, what are the reasons for CSDs to offer or explore new CSD services to be offered in addition to the core CSD functions? Javier? Javier, you're on mute. Javier. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, well, I would like to share our vision about this point. Um, in our strategy plan several years ago, we decided and we determined that was critically important for DCB to move forward and becoming a more diversified infrastructure service provider for the local market. Delivering in our connection with uh, all the participants in the market, including bank, insurance company, pension fund, stock exchanges, brokers, etc. Uh, we, of course, were in a position and, and, and also in an opportunity to develop and diversify our line of business. In this connection, our principal objective was to diversify our company's uh, business and income based beyond the, our core business uh, activity and to reduce in some way the, this dependence of the volume of the market in terms of the issues and also in the number of transactions delivered to us to be processed. Uh, probably like many CSD, we wanted to exert greater control over our future and to be relegated simply to processing uh, business generated by others. Uh, our response uh, in, in, this, in this context was, uh, was to split in different stages. The first one was create different subsidiaries. We have two subsidiaries, as I mentioned before, and following this initial step, we expanded our services and included, first of all, collateral management with electronic pledge registration for a broad range of uses not just for the CCP guarantees uh, activities. We also began to offer uh, forward contract services and establish ourselves as an electronic trade repository for this operation. We undertook a huge corporate effort to provide cross-border custody services. In this connection, we established several international links, as I mentioned before, with the US and LATAM, and also with Euroclear, 
uh, to provide custody for that uh, participant in Chile investing in, in, in Europe and also for European uh, investors who are investing in the country. We create a line of services to provide data uh, on the market volume and statistic. And this service has been proved attractive, not just for our current uh, or traditional um, participant, also for a broader customer base. Uh, we started offering tax agent services for foreign investors. It's a new line of services that we have in place. We also started offering electronic voting for shareholding meetings using a, a, a robust uh, blockchain platform for, to do that. And of course, uh, in some way, COVID helped us <laughs> to, to move very fast with, with these services. And also, we have been providing a fiscal custodian service uh, for some specific asset classes in the local market that not are trading in the stock exchange. Uh, something interesting today, uh, the income for these new services represent almost 45% of the DCB incomes for the company. And of course, we are continue looking for uh, new potential services to offer. So uh, that was a, a strategy for the company to, to expand our services to other areas, not just focus in the core uh, traditional business for CSD. That could be our experience in few in few words. Thank you very much, Javier. Hannah, what are your reasons? I think in, in addition to the obvious, which is obviously diversification uh, of the products and services and, and generating more revenues, I think the ancillary side provides us a little, little bit more flexibility to offer services and give a bit of a trials and, and sort of proof of concepts with our clients as the core is so rigid and, and, and obviously needs, uh, needs a, a, a whole nother approach. But I, I think in all in all, what I would like to say is that maybe the uh, additional services that we provide, I think they're a natural fit to our role as a service provider, uh, as a market infrastructure, and, and uh, I would even extend it to, to the role that we have in society. Thank you, Hannah. And Pierre, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Of course, I agree with the points of Anna. What I would add is that there is a, a market demand. Um, the custody chain is under um, quite a significant margin pressure, so our clients need to focus on their core business. And therefore, what we see is that they are willing to um, offload some of, of these added value services to the CSD, which is well-placed to, uh, to deliver the, the service for the market. So I think that that point is really important. And the other comment I'd like to make is that these uh, added value services do not only contribute to diver diversifying the revenues, but they also put more glue in the relationship with our clients, which is really important especially I would say in Europe where we play in a competitive landscape and the relationship with client is, uh, is key. Thank you, Pierre. Um, Krem, what are your views from Turkey? Okay. Uh, my comments will be generally about uh, the disruptive technology point of view. Uh, as we all know, in the last 10 to 15 years, CSTs have experienced a great shift in their business models. Uh, the wave of post-crisis regulatory initiatives and projects such as uh, T2S in EU, in EU uh, draw commoditization of core CST services, and uh, we see core CST services handled uh, by digital asset exchanges, for example. And this is direct threat to CSTs, I think, in short term and mid term as well. Uh, there are increasing competitive pressures to traditional exchanges uh, due to alternative investment mechanisms such as crowdfunding platforms and the rising disruptive technologies such as uh, decentralized finance DeFi. Uh, these developments leave CSTs having to devise new strategies to diversify their services and tip their tools in these areas too. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't uh, a real solution on all over the world uh, uh, as all of us see. Uh, and while transaction volumes have increased all over the world in the post-pandemic period, the expectations of the market participants from infrastructure institutions like CSTs have also been transferred. Uh, the development of new products and services based on clouds, artificial intelligence, big data and blockchain technologies have started to gain more prevalence. And uh, automation, digitalization, data analysis, and operational flexibility capabilities provide cost and risk management advantages to capital market infra infrastructure institutions like all of us. Uh, in particular, institutions that focus on services based on digitalization 
and data management uh, in their uh, growth strategies adapt more easily to the post-pandemic period and create competitive advantages for the financial and capital markets they serve. Uh, that's all I can say for now. Thanks. Thank you, Krem. Thank you. And Indas, uh, from the Nasdaq CSDs, how do you see this? Thanks. Yes, to, to my question, I'd outline that it, it helps us to go beyond the, our role in capital markets and, and bring, sort of build our brand, like with pension registrar services. It's, it's a national importance service, so it, it just adds to our weight in our discussions with the government, and we're, we're pleased to, to help out. Like with ISIN allocation service, it's, it's clear customer demand and a, they've got a problem and, and we are happy that we can develop tailored service and, and help them to provide the sort of to, to solve the problem. And, and also it allows like working with the P2P platforms, FinTech, it, it just you know, allows us to be in touch with, with, the, with the newer and startup type of uh, companies. But of course, above everything, uh, it, it is it is uh, revenue growth. We are also listed uh, company in our own stock exchange at uh, Nasdaq in New York, and we have all the pressure in the world for all the quarterly earnings and so on. So it, it's always a constant search for for new growth opportunities. Good, thank you. And then let's move on to the next one, and I ask you kindly ask you just to answer with uh, naming the, the, the ways, the areas in which you think the most reasonable fields for CSDs to scale up uh, our current portfolio among the following areas. New products, services, new assets, new clients, new geographies. What are, from your point of view, Pierre, the most relevant for uh, the CSDs? So I think the, the four categories that you mentioned, new assets and new geographies, uh, new clients and new products and services, they are all reasonable and relevant. But I would say two of them are quite natural, whilst the two others are more artificial or more complex. The, the two that are very natural in my view, it's uh, uh, adding new clients and adding new products and services. Adding new clients, I mean, what we see, especially these days, is a constant flow of international players that were previously relying on um, local custodians to access our infrastructures, and they now want to access directly the infrastructure. So there is a constant pipe of new clients that want to join, and that's kind of business as usual. Um, new products and services, it's also natural because, I mean, we know the markets by her. So, so identifying the pain point of the market and marginally um, increasing our service offering to address the pain point is, is also something we do uh, day after day. When it comes to uh, tapping into new geographies um, or new assets, it's a totally different game because uh, you need to structure a whole new offering with an ecosystem, right? And um, um, like, like in that, we see uh, um, a good demand from uh, private companies, for instance, which is a new asset class for, for us. Um, but, but that's a much more difficult way to grow the business. In your next, what we've done is we, we've acquired CSDs to grow geographically, right? But, but uh, do we, doing it organically, right? It's a much more ambitious uh, journey. Um, <coughs> so two very natural ways to grow, two more complex and artificial, but still exciting. Thank you, Pierre. Hannah, tell us. Um, just to add on that, so I, I agree with Pierre's categorization. I think that makes a lot of sense. In terms of new assets, I think there's still lo local opportunities, at least here in, in, in Helsinki. Uh, but on the sort of geographical side, I think uh, um, there's still some obstacles. I mean, CSDR is here. A lot of regulatory uh, uh, development has happened, but there's not that natural consolidation and to, to gain the benefits of... of uh, of uh, you know merging CSDs and and, and moving to to uh, a lean structure is still very difficult because of some uh, local specifics, uh, bankruptcy laws and other things. So I think that will be a bit of a challenge. Uh, however, there are some good examples. Obviously, Indra's here on the Baltic side, and 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 for your clear ESIS on on the same platforms. But it, there's still some obstacles. I think that is a bit of a challenge to gain the true benefits of of uh, internalization or geographical. Uh, movement, but I, I think on the new products and services, clearly data, data ESG related and, and whatever data, I think that's a hot topic for all of us, I'm sure. 
Sure. Thank you, Hannah. And Krem? Uh, actually, I'd like to say for all of them, uh, I mean, new products and services with new assets and implementing them for new clients and new geographies. So <laughs> I, I think CSTs are capable to move up the value chain considering their role in capital markets internationally uh, between issuer companies, intermediary institutions and investors. Uh, for instance, by leveraging our position between issuer companies and investors as a data aggregator, we started initiating a number of technology-intensive projects. By 2010, uh, enactment of new capital market legislation in 2012 further paved uh, the way for MKK to develop new value-added platforms for a wider range of parties, from academia to agricultural producers. For example, for the, the developed uh, EGM solution for uh, capital market companies uh, in Turkey here first, and then we sold also to Indonesian capital markets. It's a, it's a good example uh, as a technological product, I think. Uh, in agricultural uh, product uh, certificates, uh, it means also a new assets we can produce, new assets and uh, new services for new clients in different geographies and different countries, I think. Uh, and uh, in trade repository side, we have all CSDs have lots of data uh, regarding with different markets and different uh, investor types and all kind of financial data. If we, if we can analyze it, we can uh, produce very well new products uh, and to sell uh, in locally and globally, I think, or uh, provide to authorities, uh, I think. Uh, under TR services, we, we have developing uh, such kind of things. Uh, I can uh, shortly summarize uh, for all of them. Uh, all are okay. the same importance, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much, Krem. And Indas, what about you? Yes, I agree. It's mainly new services to existing clients, to new customers in, in all the different ways. The, the other two are more dependent on external factors, like with new asset classes, there's been relatively slow securitization uh, of assets in, in the Baltic, so it, we really can, can respond to demand when, when it's there. With new geographies, uh, of course, we, we passport these services to some countries, but, but you know, that's going to be always case-by-case -case basis for specific issues. To really enter into new geographies, it's, it's a tall order. It, it, first of all, is a question to that. Uh, market, whether there is big enough problem, whether they are ready to, you know, work with another CSD and, and so on. It, it's all, always going to be challenging. But but actually in, in Iceland, there is another uh, issue, uh, CSD. So we, we also work in an environment where there are two domestic uh, CSDs. Okay. Thank you. And Javier? Well, I don't want to repeat, but I agree with, with the other panelists on and, and all the areas that you mentioned, Jesus, probably has to be in a focus for all of the CSD in, in the world. But for us, particularly, I would like to, and we are focused today, uh, considering the capital market business model is undergoing in rapid change. Uh, Steaming from the emerging, uh, from the fintech companies, we are focused uh, in, the, in the new asset, uh, particularly tokens, uh, which could represent equity, debt, or other kind, other kind of assets. So we're focused on that today, and uh, and we think that that's going to represent, at least in the local market, in the case of Chile, new potential clients as an issuer, as an investor. So it could be a, a new environment for 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 the CSD. Probably uh, we got no, probably we actually put focus on that rather than our integration process in LATAM, uh, another initiative. But I think that could be the, the main focus for the, for the next years. Okay, thank you. Then let's move on to another question. And um, I would like to know to what extent these new potential services are actually a response to market demand from our clients or a more internal decision from CSDs to diversify the current revenue base. Pierre, how do you see it? So it's always a combination of the two. However, the relative weights of the two factors may differ. Let me take two examples. Um, in Norway, a um, couple of months ago, uh, 
most market participants came to us and, and told us, look, we have a problem with um, uh, anti-money laundering uh, uh, regulations. When uh, uh, we pay corporate actions in the system because there are retail accounts in the CSD, we need to do some checks and we need to be able to block some corporate actions payments. And the market doesn't have any solution for that. So could you, CSD, create a solution that will solve the problem in one go for all the market? And this is what we did. And we are now finalizing the, the build of this uh, new feature. So this is an example where the market demand was first. And of course, we had an interest in doing that. Another example where it's the reverse, uh, it's uh, about uh, general meetings. So as you all know, with the COVID pandemic, um, there has been a big development on virtual uh, general meetings. And, and we saw the commercial opportunity to, um, to grow that business, which, which is what we did. So of course, there was a market demand for that, but the trigger has been our own internal commercial thinking um, where we saw that there was an opportunity to grow the business in that space. So it's always a combination of the two, but what comes first depends from a case to case. Okay, thank you. Um, Hannah, how do you see this uh, question? I agree. I, I sort of do believe that there is always a market demand and obviously there needs to be a business case. Let's be real. We're all in the business of making profits as well. But I, I sort of believe to some extent there's always the, the third element, which is regulatory driven functionality that we all need to comply with. At times it, it serves as a service. At times it's just a mandatory must uh, to, to keep the license and, and to put a lot of focus in, and it takes a little bit of bandwidth. I, I, I think we all agree. Um, but um, for me, I think um, it can only work that there is a genuine need for the market. What we can do is in the, indeed, once we have uh, established a market need or a client need, then, then scale up and, and, and certainly make uh, pro products and services commercial. But uh, the other way around, just to drive the, the revenues is, 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 in my opinion, not mm -hmm. going to work. Okay. I think we have, uh, thank you, Hannah. We have a question from the audience. In a global world with cross-border transactions, how do you foresee that the problem that may happen in a trading venue, it does not trigger problems on the settlement side or the other way around? Recently, we have experienced some issues on T2S and we have seen the impact this had in many markets. Isabel Vidal, thank you, Isabel, for the question. <laughs> Very interesting. Not easy. <laughs> who, who, who is uh, so brave to answer this? Maybe... If you allow me, I think obviously we are in a global market. Uh, we are in a global world. We are interacting more and more. And actually, we are very aware of the um, interactions that we have uh, among the different financial market infrastructures. And obviously, that is the challenge we have to face running a financial market infrastructure is that we, we have a lot of uh, threats uh, um, for many different uh, reasons. And we have to be able to, to cope with this and to face these this, uh, threats. So far, so good, but you never know for the future. That is something that we have to always prepare, always to be prepared. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is from my side, the question. I don't know if from the panelists, sorry to jump in this, but if you have to add, uh, you want to add anything else? Maybe nope. uh, just to yeah. say, uh, I think if there is a hiccup on the trading venue, it depends on the hiccup, whether it will impact the settlement side or the CSD side of things. It could or it could not. Uh, but if we have issues on the, on the sort of CSD side and, and settlement or whatever, I think uh, at least in Finland, within a short time, this uh, sort of trading venue will need to stop uh, uh, trading. So um, I see that as a, as a very severe issue. And certainly with T2S, that exposure is, is uh, broader, uh, at least on the European level, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, let's then move on very quickly. Let's go to, uh, I think, Javier, you mentioned, if I got you correctly, you mentioned that 40% um, of your incomes stem from uh, the ancillary services, uh, which is an impressive amount. May I ask uh, Krem and Inders, uh, what are, in terms of revenues or EBITDA, um, the um, percentage, the significant percentage, if this is the case that you have in your own companies from ancillary services? Uh, Krem? Okay, thanks. Uh, firstly, maybe I can give information about our R&D uh, uh, center. We became the first capital market institution in Turkey to receive a research and development center designation in 2013. And uh, allowing the CSDs to receive financial support from the state for the development of its technology-intensive projects. 
So far, we launched more than 40 R&D projects and increased the share of uh, our value-added services in the revenue uh, to around uh, more than uh, uh, 20% by implementing our systems around the world. And uh, however, since the early beginnings of launching our value-added systems and platforms, our main focus has always been using the NIF theme uh, of revenues to reduce costs for our domestic and foreign markets participants and make our market infrastructure more efficient, actually. Transparent and safe, of course. Also, we believe that all new services will show the main effects on EBIT uh, in long time duration. Uh, you know, uh, it's the cost of uh, investment uh, in the first uh, years, uh, but uh, in long time duration, uh, it, it, it will affect, uh, of course, EBIT uh, much more. Okay, thank you. And Inders, I, I think you mentioned that the ancillary services have been always very important for you. Do you have a significant percentage of your revenues or a bit from the ancillary services? Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, to, to have it in round figures, probably about one third of revenue comes from ancillary services. And good question about the profitability, because of course we come from industry where we generally have high margins. So actually to match it with ancillary services is not always a gimme. And in a way, managers sometimes are biased to go for growth just for the sake of growth. So the, the real art is really to make it as a profitable growth. And uh, I'm pleased to say that generally we are we're successful in, in this, but we've had our own learnings as well, like with, with LEI service uh, for LEI issuance, it, it's, been, it's been slower than we expected. And then again, some of the other ancillary services are, are just brilliant also from financial perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Then uh, let me move on to one of the, probably the favorite topic from Pure, which is the uh, banking services. Uh, Pure, do you think that banking services is a natural way for CSDs to scale up, at least for those that do not have a banking license today? Thank you for the question, Jesus, which is particularly relevant in the context where European authorities are reviewing CSDR and are trying to find out what's the right balance on this topic. So um, running a bank and running a market infrastructure are two very different businesses. And I think, um, at least in Europe, the regulation allows for some overlap, but that overlap needs to remain limited. Um, the point is that when you run a CSD, there needs to be a bank involved, right, especially for the settlement. So. In an ideal world, the bank will be always a central bank. Um, the problem is that uh, when it's about the domestic currency, it works very well. But when, when you try to support uh, your market with multiple currencies, and we all know that uh, many issuers, especially in the fixed income space, need to issue in multiple currencies because of their global business, then connecting to multiple central banks is a very complex task. So my, my view on this point is that the, the ideal model is one where CSDs can freely connect to multiple central banks to support activity in multiple currencies. But when the volume of business does not justify the huge investment cost to connect to a central bank, I believe that the, the right model, if you don't already have a banking license as a CSD, is to partner with large banks that can provide services in commercial bank money. It's less, um, it's more risky than uh, central bank money, but for small amount of, uh, of, uh, of business um, and for currencies which are requested by the market, that's the right way to go, in my view. Thank you, Pierre. Hannah, how do you see this? Well, as, as I'm fully aligned with Pierre, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, if, if you want as a domestic CSD to scale up, I think, you know, going international is, is certainly an option. But at the end of the day, as, as uh, Pierre said, you need to sort of balance a bit uh, banking license and, and the cost of it and, and the sort of requirements that come with it. Certainly um, having a sort of banking license as a CSD. Uh, but it is, an, is, a, it is a sort of potential possibility um, that can be explored, maybe not for all, but uh, certainly as an opportunity. Okay, thank you. I think we have two interesting questions from the audience. The first one is related to the user community, uh, as long as the CSD are mandated to establish this as a body of cooperation between the CSDs and its users. And the question is related to what is your experience? How do you see it? I think it's 
To some extent related to the European Union sees this as long as this uh, user committee is mandated, as I mentioned, by the European regulation. But of course, I understand that there are similar bodies or, or organizations in, in the other cities around the globe. So do you have any, any quick answer for this? Uh, is positive? Uh, how do you see it? Yeah, Hannah. Very positive. And, and as I said, it's, it's in a sense, it's nothing new. We've always had certain client committees, but I, I think the interaction is good. It is an advisory committee, uh, a user committee. And I think what is bringing value is a direct dialogue between the user committee and the board of Euclid Finland in this case, which, which has been sort of very interesting to watch. And I think uh, it has eased the cooperation in general. And, and I think it has improved any dialogue that, uh, yeah. that needs to be there. So very, very positive. I fully agree with you, but any <clears throat> other view? Any negative? Pure? No, I'm not saying that you're negative. <laughs> Let me finish, but, but I think the interesting point, because we are present in multiple markets with very different cultures, is to see that the role of the user community very much depends on the culture, right? In the Nordics, I can only concur with Hannah, there is a good culture of sitting together, discussing together, engaging, etc. In other markets, it's more bilateral than multilateral. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that we have the same um, user committees across all markets, but actually their level of engagement depends a bit on, on the culture of the country where the user committee uh, sits. That's a good point. Okay, let's move on then to the to the other question from the audience, which is very interesting from my viewpoint, is uh, any brief comments on business optimization within the context of the move to T plus one accelerated settlement? I, I know that this is, uh, of course, a, a discussion a very, um, a very important now in the Americas because of the US market decision to move on to the T plus one, I think for, 2024, and I, I assume uh, Javier that this is affecting the other CSDs. Uh, I know some other CSDs in America that are thinking uh, in moving to T plus one. How do you see this? Well, actually, it's true. Uh, we organized a few months ago a, a webinar between the AXA members regarding the initiative from DTC, and of course, it's DTC and also TMX in Canada also have to move in, in, in parallel with with the US. And uh, it's something that many CSD in, in the region, in, in America's continent, have to, to keep in mind and work on that because many of us have a link with the, with the U.S. market in, with DTC. Actually, uh, it's the case of Argentina, Peru, and Mexico, well, also Chile and also Brazil. So it's something that probably, uh, not probably actually, we have to work on that. Uh, we're trying to, to, to follow very closely the initiative with DTC. DTC is, at the, is at the biggest AXDA member, so they have been providing update time by time about the, the, the steps and the, and the impact of this initiative. And of course, probably the, the optimization of liquidity and reduced risk is our, one of the main, main targets in this initiative. But uh, it's going to have a huge impact in probably in all the stock exchanges in the region, which have cross-listing papers uh, traded in between the, with the US market and Canada. So, uh, well, we are, we have, we have been working in a working group also in, in with, with FIAP, which is the stock exchanges uh, organization in LATAM. I'm very close with the U.S. to, well, to see which to be the changes that we have to do in, in each country in the region. Okay. Thank you, Javier. Um, I think we have, uh, I don't know if anyone else, sorry. Jesus, just, just one comment. Uh, sure. the, the, this webinar uh, is available if anybody in the audience wants to see it in our website. It uh, was done by Canada and the US uh, representative. So if somebody wants to, to give more information about this topic, they can go to the, the web, our website. Okay. And, and get information about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this valuable information, Javier. And I think we have the last five minutes, actually. So the last question should be very quickly answered. And I think it's uh, an open question. Um, how do you see your respective CSD or the CSD industry in the next five years, after five years' time? How do you see, Javier? Um, well, <laughs> I would like to have the, the crystal ball to, to, to see what is going on in the future. But uh, I think uh, uh, the CSD are facing tremendous challenge to their traditional business model. And, uh, and these challenges demand a strong and immediate response in most cases to with invest in growth and in more eligible way. Uh, in terms of the new technologies, uh, the CSD must respond 
to the challenge presented by the, the cyber resilience, emerging technologies as a cloud, uh, AI, blockchain, tokenization, and uh, digital asset, a new digital asset in, in the environment. Uh, for some smaller uh, infrastructure, maybe many CSD in, in LATAM are a small institution, they, they need uh, a, a huge scale to respond for this, for this challenge. And also the cooperation is something that we have to try to improve because it's, it's, it's the way to, to move ahead. Uh, of course, the, the, the new paradigm to be prepared for the new challenge, such a new business model, financial system transformation, a broader and potential more business uh, burdensome, I mean, uh, regulation is also another challenge that we have to, to keep in mind. Uh, in the case of, I'm going to talk about the, the case of Chile. We are trying to, to, to deal with this uh, new environment in the future First of all, modern, with modern, modernizing our core system, and we did a, a deal with NASDAQ, and, and we bought the new uh, system for them for CSD, and uh, we're supposed to be alive in, in three more weeks in a big band deploy. So we're a little bit nervous in the, in the, at the moment, and because it's after three years, we're going to be alive in, in June uh, 20. But it's, it's something that we have to, to improve uh, and to have this partner with, with NASDAQ to, to have a new core uh, world-class solution for the core. But also we are working in, in, the, in the new business that we are seeing in the future for the CSD industry. First of all, the POC to, to issue bonds in DLT environment. We did a POC with the central bank in 2020, and now we are in the stage two uh, with the corporate bonds. So I think that, and also, uh, working in a digital CSD is something that we has been working in. Uh, we began to work uh, uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, it's probably the main challenge that for DCP, at least uh, in the way that we are seeing the future for the industry. That's going to allow us to to register any any class of asset, uh, you know, any kind of tokens, and also connect with the new platform for. Uh, for the new issuers that were looking for uh, well, rise Thank money you. in new ways. Thank you, Javier. I think good luck in the three weeks uh, of this big bang, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be good. Uh, and this is a good way to move to NASDAQ, to Indus. Uh, how do you see the future in five years' time? Yes. Well, I don't think there's going to be something like overly dramatic or nuclear explosion of DLT or something like that. Uh, but the competition will, will increase from different angles, so I think it's going to lead to just more and more clear focus on, on issues. Issues is the driving force behind our business, and uh, for example, we now build self-service portal for issues to, to make them happy and, and provide better service. So I think, yes, the, the focus on issues is maybe something I'd like to underscore. Okay. Thank you. Just two minutes, I will give the floor if you want to add anything from Pierre, Hannah, and Ekrem on the next five years. How do you see Pierre? Do you have anything to add? No, I mean, uh, maybe two bets. First one, we will all be uh, working very hard on some super large uh, regulatory project. And, and secondly, um, probably we'll, most of us will use GLT as part of our like normal service offering, right? So I don't believe there will be disruption, but, but we will all use that as part of our standard software toolkit to deliver some services to our customers. Okay, thank you, Krem. Do you want it? Krem, yes. Uh, Very quickly, please. Well, okay, when I was describing the blockchain, I was using, um, emphasizing three uh, concepts and words. That one is securitization, the other one digitalization and globalization. So uh, it's a mix of and merge of uh, these uh, concepts. I think, uh, we should uh, think o over uh, these concepts as CSTs. We, we, we need to integration between countries with new assets, with, uh, and we, we have competition with uh, emerging new digital assets. Uh, we should find solutions uh, to give services for the, for them as well. And we are like a, like fintech companies. We should have very uh, strong uh, technical infrastructures, and uh, I think we, we will be developing uh, all, all of these uh, concepts and technology. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah, last words from your side. You want well, to? Well, at, 
I'd like to say that Finland will be on T2S for sure in the next five years, but uh, I hope we all sort of uh, come out of uh, what's going on uh, currently in the world uh, and, and sort of inflation won't be too hard <laughs> on all of us. So these types of, types of elements are certainly on our radar. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, it has been really a pleasure to moderate this panel and just in time, uh, I'm back to Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, dear judges, dear panelists. I hope you can hear me now. Um, so indeed, it has been a great pleasure here in this panel. Uh, among other things, I think that we have um, we need now to congratulate Ahasus as well for his new position within uh, within the newly created indeed this joint uh, group of six BME. So now it is a six group, and so Ahasus, we are really very pleased and uh, believe that it is certainly well deserved on your side. So congratulations um, to you personally. Um, and then also what we would like to say is that these have been all very valuable lessons that we have learned from our brilliant uh, speakers. Thank you for those. Now that we have spoken about all these uh, business optimizations, I think that what needs to be highlighted is that all of this, of course, does result in major positive impact for the issuers, for the CSD participants balance sheet, and hence major cost reductions and higher efficiency for the markets overall. So I'm really very pleased that you have been able to share these examples and hope that this will be an inspiration for other colleagues uh, indeed to uh, perform the same um, the same type of optimization as well. So now uh, we have closed this panel and we'll be able to take a break. Uh, this one will be a longer break of 30 minutes uh, and we'll be back at 1.45 Central European time. So at 45 of this hour, uh, we will be waiting for you back and we'll be discussing a very topical matter uh, these days, right? Uh, the one that has been touched upon by many of the different panels of the conference on the settlement cycle. So let's be back at uh, 1.45 Central European time. And after that, my colleague Bruce Butteril, uh, the executive director of AXDO, will be with you to guide you through this next session um, of the conference. Thank you. Delighted to be uh, invited to briefly talk to the global CSD community again. Thank you so much. In terms of your your question, I mean, it all started because the SEC wanted to examine uh, CSD uh, risk exposure in '97. 
as part of their investor protection um, mission. And the result in July 21 was 17 F7 being a, an amendment to the 40s Act. Um, it, it essentially enabled funds to maintain uh, assets of CSDs uh, subject to custodians providing constant monitoring of CSD risks uh, to their fund clients, advisors, and advising them of material change to risk. So, I mean, Thomas Murray put together a group of uh, 11 major banks and an I ICSD in 2000 uh, to define those custody risks. That work was completed just around 9 11, 2001. And um, we established an internet based data management tool and a global operating model to capture a constant flow of data relating to uh, CSD risks. And today, 80% um, of the world's uh, custodian banks utilize our intraday view of CSD risks. They in turn distribute these risk assessments to thousands of their investment clients, including funds. Well, the original CSD risks that we uh, defined in 2001 were asset commitment, liquidity, counterparty, operational, financial, and CSD on CSD risk. We added in 2005 uh, asset servicing risk. 2012, we added in asset safety, uh, governance, and transparency. Uh, last year, 2021, we added cyber, which is a constant monitoring of cyber risk exposure. And this year, we're um, rolling out ESG, uh, which will actually absorb the governance and transparency uh, risk that I just referenced. Um, the key for us is to continually deliver a, a sort of stream of data on, on the risk profiles of CSDs across the world. Our risk assessments are updated throughout the day and API data feeds deliver data, you know, those updates every 10 minutes to selected clients. So it's a, it's at a constant intraday uh, tracking of risks across 140 CSDs, um, you know, throughout the world. It's fair to say that the CSDs actually acquitted themselves incredibly well throughout the various financial and other crises over the last 25 years. I mean, most other parts of the global financial system have suffered catastrophic collapse, uh, particularly major banks and the odd CCP. Um, however, I mean, I think today cyber risk exposure is undoubtedly the, the very hot topic. Um, as cyber attacks increase, whether they're state sponsored or not. I mean, our cyber risk assessment tool is now widely adopted across the financial services industry. It shows, I must say, significant and worrying differences between how CSDs compare to each other in terms of their ability to minimize cyber risk exposure, essentially the external attack surface of their organizations. So, you know, constant cyber risk uh, exposure monitoring is a major concern and must be properly done. Uh, the EU and SEC are driving uh, the need for constant monitoring of, of CSD risks and cyber risk is a particular um, uh, area of interest. We built proprietary technology tools, um, which have been constantly upgraded over the last 20 years to start this whole CSD risk uh, assessment process and the daily uh, data capture. Um, it was it was done for this community. It was done to track CSD uh, risk exposure. Uh, these tools uh, support our global operating model. It captures data, um, allows us essentially to capture data throughout the day. Um, and for us to then publish uh, the findings uh, daily. Over 60 major banks white label these technology tools and blend their own data with, uh, you know, uh, with our risk assessments. And these CSD risk assessments are distributed by these banks uh, to thousands of funds and, um, and other banks throughout the world. Um, and our latest tool, uh, the cyber risk assessment tool, is, as I say, something that's been widely adopted over the last uh, 10 months. And we hope it will greatly assist all of the CSDs who might look at this uh, data clip uh, or to minimize your cyber risk exposure. Thank you very much. <laughs>